Hello and welcome back to Dial H for Hero Clicks. I'm your Billion Clicks co host, Simeon Bruce. On this episode, we'll be revisiting the new clicks on the block segment, but in a slightly different way. We have some guesses as to what will be showing up on the Clicks Cup, a uh, What's Wiz Kids Up To update, and finally, a super secret bonus content that'll be happening mid show. This is episode 373. Let's make Hero Clicks the way it should be. So if you're looking for emotional satisfaction, my advice to you is seek professional Hero Clicks. No. Are you serious? Again? How many people even play this game? Like the hundred? Instant deadpan humor. Oh, how many six yeah. people yeah. think I am funny? It's the hard day's work. Not that you know anything about that. Which absolute fools? It's not richer nonsense. I'm gonna make Hero Clicks like that forever. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Hey, Google, back some more. Let's attack him because he's a jerk. Wow, wow, wow. I like that. I like that, uh, that twist. <laughs> yes, the you're evil actually have, is in the house. You're, you're going to have an actual... Uh, I don't remember who said it in the Discord, but you're going to have an actual... Um, Oh my god, what's a sl- slogan, a catchphrase? There you are you're going to have a catchphrase now. The catchphrase, yeah, the f- finally have a catchphrase. I tried for a while, I tried for a while to have a catchphrase. Like I said, I am Simeon Bruce, joining me this week is not any kind of sexy ranch hand called Ernest. No, 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 it's someone much better, it's Alex, our on-hand magic expert and uh, aficionado who can bridge the gap, the divide between the two biggest games i would say because <laughs> hero clicks is just so huge compared to magic right i mean absolutely i mean they're the two biggest but it's hero clicks by a country mile oh yes 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 so alex how, how's it going we we uh, inter- you interviewed you before so we won't go back into uh the when did you start all that kind of stuff because you've got a lot more important stuff to talk about this week um, yes but we will ask, because we ask every week, and I say we as the royal we, which is me, Billion Clicks Bruce. Um, what made you happy this week, Alex? Uh, actually, uh, lots of things. It was a very good week, but I'll keep it short. Um, on Tuesday, uh, we went over to a friend's house for a doggy play date. They got a new puppy. We brought our dog, and they got to meet and hang out and have fun, and that went great. We weren't sure how it was going to go, but it went spectacularly. Um, and then we also played some board games with them. Um, one we spent the most time playing is a game called Forgotten Waters, which is a cooperative game where you play as a pirate crew, and it's all very, like, it's a very humorous game. But um, basically, you uh, you each have a person, you put it on um, the page of the book. There's like a storybook kind of thing. And you uh, put it on the page in order to take actions. You do that simultaneously. Then you resolve them top down. Uh, There's a fully voice acted companion app for the game uh, to tell the story. And you have to like kind of choose your adventure, make some decisions. Uh, It's it's a lot of fun. And then the other thing was um, actually earlier today before we recorded, I went over to a friend's house and we played hero clicks and stuff. So good things. Nice. Yeah. I I really like cooperative uh board games they seem to be like few and far between but um i recently played what is it betrayal which is a a mostly cooperative game mostly yeah (laughs) until it's suddenly not (laughs) until yeah until eventually it's not um but yeah they're just it's so much fun to like kind of have uh like almost zero competitive aspect and it's just you know fully can we can we like uh, group together and defeat this whatever thing? Uh, but yeah, I get that. That's that's pretty fun. Um, what made me happy this week is, you know, it, since you're listening to podcast, clearly you're you're listening to this show. If you're hearing me right now, um, you should also listen to audiobooks because we're not sponsored by audiobooks. By the way, we are sponsored. <laughs> because I already forgot. We are sponsored by CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, including all the latest Heroclix singles and sealed products. So you should check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. And while you're doing that, you could listen to 
Audible. Um, we're not sponsored by them, but uh, Audible has done a ori- like a new original-ish series with Neil Gaiman. It's doing the Sandman comic series, the the graphic novel. I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, if you haven't read the Sandman graphic novel, you should. But if you don't want to, this Audible book um, series one is already out, and they're coming out with series two. James, James McVoy, uh, I don't know. Who's the new, the guy who played the new Charles Xavier in the newer X-Men? Um, oh, I, I think that's... It McElroy? Mc, McVoy? Uh, something like that. Mc, McAvoy. McAvoy, that's why. <laughs> There's an, an extra syllable. Yeah, it was, was close, yep. Uh, so he plays the role of Morpheus. Um, and... You know, he's just got like a really good voice. They've already done series one. You can already listen to that one. And they're starting series two. It's going to drop here in a little bit. Um, but man, the casting is just crazy. So uh, some of the, the bigger names is uh, I already said uh, James. That's like the the real big dude, I think, as far as comics go. Fennings, Autumn. Andy Circus. Michael Sheen. Andy Serkis. I'm reading an article about the um, Sandman Act 2 thing. Oh, yes. Uh, Bill Nighy, um, which you've definitely seen him in stuff. He's kind of a character actor, so you might not have recognized him, but he's definitely been in something that you've seen. Um, Kevin Smith. Ooh, David Tennant. Of course, yeah. David Tennant as Loki. Uh, Kevin Smith is... Uh, of course, from like Clerks fame and from, uh, I don't know, Ben Affleck's friend fame. What else has Kevin Smith done? He's done. He stuff. could play the shark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. There's so John Lithgow. Um. Hard to picture him and like which stuff he's been. To, but again, like just like these huge, uh, character actors that you've like definitely seen in things, and then uh, like Brian Cox. Brian Cox is like the angry dad that's been in like, or angry military dude that's been in like a ton of stuff. He's just got one of those faces for anger, I guess. Um, Kat Dennings plays death. Yeah. Just a a really good series. I've really enjoyed act one. Uh, I enjoyed the graphic novel tremendously. Uh, And then like, I guess the biggest thing is uh, the narrator. So anytime it's not one of these great actors doing the voices, the narrator is Neil Gaiman himself. So that adds like a whole other layer because, you know, you always read stuff with like your own internal kind of narration. But when the person who like put pen to paper is narrating it they're reading it as like they interpreted it to be read so that's really cool i've really enjoyed neil gaiman and he's got like that really deep british kind of voice kind of like a tom waits kind of thing going on so i enjoy that but yeah that's what made me happy they announced act two's coming out i really enjoyed act one um there's also like a Wolverine The Longest Road thing, which I haven't checked out, but that's another audiobook kind of thing. Um, and they're not necessarily books, but, you know, whatever. If you have the time and the money and the, the will to listen to it, I suppose it'll be okay. But that's enough of what made us happy. It's time to get into the news. <laughs> All right, the news this week is kind of kind of short and sweet, but uh, WizKids is kind of trolling us on Twitter a little bit, and it's fair because, I mean, have you seen how people treat the people that run the WizKids uh, Twitter handle? So, yeah, um, but uh, WizKids posted today, they posted the some Wonder Woman 80th sculpts and then thrown in the mix was a Batman with Jaro 3D rendering, which we saw this as a actual sculpt sitting on like a shelf at one point way back when, I think early 2020, as a convention exclusive. So we know it's it's there. It's a thing that they made. Um, they made no mention as to it at all. They just dropped it in with these other sculpts as if it belonged. Very strange, WizKids. Very strange. Uh, they also 
a couple days back, they dropped a picture of a Cree soldier, what appears to be a Cree soldier. He's squatted down with a rifle in hand. And what I'm guessing is uh, some sort of higher up scroll, some scroll lady. I don't know if it's the uh, the queen of the scrolls or not, because we don't have any details on them. It's just the 3D renderings that they posted. But Looks yeah, cool. I'm pretty sure that's going to be Empire. That's the only set that's coming up that makes sense for those two figures. And uh, that's pretty cool. I really like the Kree. I really like scrolls. Um, not nearly enough Cree in modern, but we have a ton of scrolls to work with. So hopefully the set's chock full of them. I mean, we we should get a lot more Cree in Empire because Empire's scrolls and Cree team up together under Hulkling. Right. Yeah. So, so essentially the yeah the uh, the storyline is like a, a th- third threat that is outweighing. Um, the Kree or scrolls, so they have to team up to once again team up to uh, fight. What is it? A living tree or a living rose bush, something like that is what, I think what the storyline is. I haven't actually read the whole thing. I just read like the prelude <laughs> comics, so I'm I'm not sure. I haven't gotten into it either yet. Uh, but yeah. yes, it's um, it sounds interesting. I know Hulkling is actually part scroll, if I remember rightly. So yeah, he's he is half scroll. Yeah, that's that makes it like an interesting dynamic there. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm just excited to get more of the, let's say, outside of Earth kind of figures because sometimes we just get a real lack of those, um, and it'd be cool to be able to do like a nihilist brood, Cree scrolls. And sometimes we get. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. Sometimes we get three X Men sets in a calendar year. <laughs> yes, sometimes it's all <laughs> X Men. Turns out mutants don't happen on other planets unless it's like the Super Scroll X Men guy. Um, I don't know if that really counts. Yeah, we've got <laughs> we've got Moon mutants. They're called the Inhumans. Isn't that fun? Uh, and then uh, next up on news is. Uh, Speaking of WizKids, Master Mold is popping up in stores all of a sudden. From out of nowhere, Master Mold arises. Alex, can you you give us more information on that? So um, before I start talking about store stuff, um, I am the manager of a store. uh, So that's how I know a lot of store stuff. (laughs) Um, We have two stores in Michigan, one in Frankenmuth, one in Bay City. We're called The Stadium. But... um, so, Master Mold is a one-per-store promo for organized play purposes. We got ours shipped to us, it, uh, This we got it this week, and I was very excited. And then I realized that I have no idea how I'm supposed to get this out. No one ever but ever told me. So, I managed to get a hold of someone at WizKids to be like, Hey, is there anything that's going to be announced for this? Should I be... Holding on to this, all I know is it's for organized play, but no, nothing else. And uh, the response I got was basically that they wanted stores to be able to be flexible with it, so they did not create a um, direct organized play program for it. Um, and stores can pretty much do what they want in order to give it out um, at their discretion, as long as it is organized play prizing. The intent is it is something that stores can use to help players come back to their store and um, have a great kickoff of coming back to events after, um, what's the word we use instead of the other word so we don't get in trouble, Simeon? (laughs) Despacilla? Uh, Despatellus, yes. yes, Despatellus, yes. Yes. So, um, you know, as as a result of Despatellus not having um, uh, in-store play, uh, (laughs) uh, it's, it's a way to help people to drive back to stores and things for that, so... If you want Master Mold, uh, you should get a hold of stores in your area to figure out what they're doing. And since communication on this has not been great um, prior to this, maybe maybe I'm just ahead of it and they're going to say stuff otherwise. I don't know. But um, make sure that they're aware of how they're supposed to give it out and they need to come up with their own plan. Um, Yeah. Personally, I I, I haven't cemented what we're doing, but it will be a sort of month-long event sort of thing. 
Um, I do also know that they will become available in other ways later, but and it'll still be limited, but we I don't know if it'll be a buyable or if it's going to be like a con promo or I, I don't know anything of that sort. Right. Um, and I also don't know timeline of that. Maybe it becomes available in other ways two years from now. I have no idea. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's definitely... Communication is definitely key. Um, if you're not a store manager or you're not like uh, the person that helps your store order HeroClix kind of related stuff, uh, making sure that like you get this in is kind of like hard because I don't think... Did WizKids prompt you to order this at all? Um, they did send... I'm, I'm on... They have an email list for stores that I'm on, but I think a lot of stores don't know it exists. So I did get an email um, saying, hey, this is going to be coming out. Um, it's going to be a one-per-store thing. It's for organized play. Talk to your um, alliance. Their alliance is the distributor for a lot of HeroClix stuff, um, a lot of WizKid stuff, at least as far as exclusive things. Um, talk to your alliance sales rep uh, for more details. Now, who knows? Maybe the lack of communication is just from my sales rep. Generally speaking, he just tells me what he's told. But um, maybe, maybe he just forgot something. I don't know. Um, yeah. It's kind of a gray area yeah. because, I mean, we had, uh, you know, I think WizKids just barely said, like, Master Mold was going to be released um, or, like, hinted at it. And then very quickly, all of a sudden, we were seeing stores getting it. So... Yeah, uh, I'm of the opinion that if it is for organized play, that it should definitely include organized play. Um, I know that a few stores out there probably won't be hosting organized play, so how they determine how they'll give it Which out... Our store is... still isn't yet. Right. Um, we're hoping fall, but we don't have things concretely set yet. Um, hopefully soon we'll make a concrete plan, but i um, still kind of following things and developments as, as they happen. Um, so I do appreciate that it gives stores flexibility for timing for it. Um, that I, that I appreciate about the flexibility the most, even more so than coming up with formats. Yeah, that does help. That does help a lot because, uh, being able to run like a league or like a couple week event or however you want to do it is definitely better than, uh, determining like all stores, must run this event within X amount of timeline or you don't you don't get future events or like you know whatever they right. other kind of uh prize givers have determined that the you're biggest kind of thing out of I don't know though as far as like the the flexibility is good but when does this become modern age you know what if they make it modern age before some areas are really safe to open back up for in store play That'd be really yeah. awkward. Especially because, like, let's not pretend Master Mold, in my opinion, will definitely be competitive viable. Like, Oh, for sure. Uh, we've seen it sail. Even, even just as a leadership auction. on a robot team. Yeah, just Very like good. for the cheapest ro like robot leadership option, uh, not even counting all the other random stuff he does. But, um, yeah, he does have, like, quite a list of random like accessible point values and interesting stuff he can do. And yeah, I, I definitely think because robot was so prominent prior to this with the danger room robots, like still sticking around. Um, I think that he'll definitely find a place uh, on teams. So that's, uh, it's not great, but I mean, it is <laughs> what it is. We, we can't really, turn back the clock and uh, handle things better. So we just kind of have to roll with what we've got currently. Agreed. And then lastly in the news, we do have like a little bit of uh, the Fantastic Four Avengers, Avengers Fantastic Four Empire. Um, we've got the, the starter set. So we've already talked about the main set. It's going to follow the same two rare primes, two super rare primes, uh, there's going to be the standard 11 chase figures. I don't know how standard that is, but almost 12 chase figures. Um, and then we we do know, well, we kind of know, at least half of the chase figures 
are most likely going to be the Venomized X-Men due to the side of the box and just how WizKids tends to pump out Chase Venom stuff. They're really cool sculpts, but uh, it's kind of like laying the cards right out on the table because... uh, Yep. (laughs) The the Venom Chases have been, let's see, Earth X, uh, What If... um, there's got to be one more that they I've weren't heard. chases in um, Spider-Man and Venom. Yeah, Spider. Yeah, Spider-Man yeah. Venom, Absolute Carnage. That was um, kind of like a hodgepodge. That was yeah. obviously throughout. I don't expect that we'll get Venom just throughout this Empire set. That doesn't seem to make sense. But they've done weirder things. I'm guessing just from the quality of the sculpts that they're going to be at minimum super rares. And oh, for sure. Most likely. Out of 11 chases, I could see six of them being X-Men Venom versions. We've already seen the Venom version of X-23, and that's just a, a real solid sculpt. So I'm guessing, without any further information, I'm guessing that at least half of the... We have Carnage Phoenix here, too. I yeah. know I'm getting ahead yeah. of ourselves, but yeah. Carnage Phoenix, yeah, there's... There's just uh, some sculpts that you can look at and be like, yeah, that's got to be a chase. And that's kind of what that is. Um, To go along with it, there is going to be the starter set that will have 10 figures, including a couple of Fantastic Four members, and I'm assuming a couple of Fantastic Four villains. Um, 20 character cards. So again, they're going to have the double dial sort of thing going on. Uh, 18 object terrain and bystander tokens which that can be any combination of those three so no idea which how many bystanders or anything else uh six double-sided thick map tiles with no folds. that'll be like the one roman starter right so you can kind of build the map as you go kind of like make it interesting each time uh two custom avengers slash fantastic four-sided dice which hopefully those are more interesting than the ones they've previewed on the Dyson token pack. Cause the Dyson token pack is just fantastic Four. but, um, two full colored powers and ability cards, 2021 edition and one full color hero clicks core rule book, 2021 edition, which is great because now anytime somebody asks, what should I like? How should I start? How should I jump into the game? This will be the go-to for me. Um, although, like, you know, Fantastic Four Spidey and Wolverine aren't the best costumes that they have, uh, it's still, like, a pretty iconic little set that you're going to have here. And they're not costumes we get often. No, so no, definitely I'm fine not. With that. This will be the first time where we, like, finally get back to uh, all properties under the same roof, so to speak. Um, I do really like that they said... Uh, there's up to eight campaign scenarios for two players where results matter from session to session or sit down for a head-to-head single match of raw power. So the session to session thing is really cool. Um, Being able to have like an ongoing campaign style kind of thing is pretty interesting. And I really like that. Um, I hope that they have more differences than the uh, Cosmic Clash starter did because sometimes it was like, well, whoever won the previous one, they get you know, oh, an extra ten point bystander. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, um, yeah. From the box, there's a couple sculpt reuses from the main set. Um, I'm not sure if the Human Torch is one, but that's definitely one of the better Human Torch sculpts that we got. He's yep. like fully engulfed in flame and his legs are shooting good. fire out so I i'm really also like excited about um captain marvel with the um the accuser hammer yes yeah i really like the uh i always call it the ultimate weapon uh, i don't actually know what they it's call called it the, there's it's got several names um i think it was only referred to as the ultimate weapon like once or twice but it's uh the accuser hammer um something like that yeah there's a couple different names for it but essentially it's a uh, ronin's hammer but yeah, yeah her holding it is pretty cool <laughs> the storyline i read a little blurb about the storyline behind why she has it and it's actually kind of interesting makes me really want to pick up that uh that series of comics 
but yeah, that's uh, Empire. Um, Wiz kids popping up on Twitter, making like random little like blurbs and stuff. And I think that's is that everything for the news? I'm pretty sure that's everything. Master Bolt, so. yeah. So now uh, to round out the news slash kind of news, um, Clicks Cup is about to happen slash is happening, depending on when you listen to this. And so we're going to make some quick Clicks Cup guesses because why not? Um, so first up is Modern 300. And so my guess is for Modern 300, I'm not going too far out of comfortability. I'm not going to like, you know, say anything too wild. Uh, due to Wingard getting a full errata showing what he is capable of, which has essentially made him back into like what he used to be able to do. So now we for sure can use Wingard to his full capability. I'm going to say that he makes a return in the 300 modern. Uh, he won nationals and quote unquote worlds last year. So he's definitely still a piece to be reckoned with. We only got a few more bystander creators. So why wouldn't he get better? Uh, and then to go along with Wingard, uh, I think Sky Tyrant, he's been appearing on pretty much every list I've been seeing. So uh, I think he's going to live up to his surname and just kind of rule over all of the click stuff down there for modern. Um, on uh, Jason Wingard, are they changing the ruling to, I, mean, I know that they did the errata um, with kids official errata to, and it's, it works the way it used to. But originally, it had been ruled differently for the Clicks Cup. Do you know if they were changing that? That I don't know. I haven't followed the Clicks Cup oh, rulings too much. Possible. Um, I haven't. I haven't looked. I, I mean, I'm not going so obviously. But because Joe is like pretty on board with Wiz Kids, I imagine that that was like a preemptive ruling, and with the actual full errata, they'll go with those instead. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if, I, if I they do make a sure. change, um, then I agree with you. Otherwise, I don't think we'll see much Jason. And I'm sure I mean, there will be people there that will play Jason. I'm sure of that, but I'm I don't think it'll be. Yeah, a lot. it is possible that people planned on uh, running teams prior to the errata and seeing Jason's like change did not change their opinion of what they were going to run. So it's possible that you know some people just skipped him because they were planning ahead of time. So there's that mm-hmm. option. Um, I think he still makes a really good drop-off team where you can just you oh, can carry sure. him and then just... The like, other idea is any maybe maybe there's a lot of... Maybe we're looking at this the wrong way. So many of these um, of, of competitive events for the last over a year for Hero Clicks have been online, right? How many people that are looking to play in this... You know, spend bunch of money fly out or drive or whatever for the, this event for several days play in this really competitive field how many of them have actually bought all the physical things they need for the teams they've been playing oh yeah online? you're definitely not maybe see they're just the, like uh... oh yeah i have all this stuff for for <laughs> jason from before maybe i'll just play the, jason the seven uh brainiac sidelines are not gonna like <laughs> yeah those aren't gonna show up uh at most like one or two um yeah, I think sideline was like the main thing, but as far as like main force teams, um, <clears throat> it's a good thing that X Men Rise and Fall wasn't out Did yet not because come out. that would have <laughs> really that would have really pushed some budgets as far as like what can you get onto your team in time to like sure. throw a wrench in other people's stuff. Um, but that being said, like X Men, like there's going to be a couple people with full uh, Secret Six teams a couple people with some like Herald uh, lantern kind of style teams, because if I had two guy gardeners and I had an, a really decent taxi like chip or something, that's a really good play. Like dropping a double oh, sure. flurry blades across the map. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't know. Uh, it does kind of depend on what have people been actually collecting in the interim between these big tournaments. Uh, yeah, I think Spider-Man Venom, absolute carnage. All like a lot of that set is still really solid and modern. Um, even oh, if you're sure. not going for like theme, just having, you know, those, the cheapest barrier 
uh doppelganger being one of like the best monster pieces um yeah there's, there's due to the like a lot of the um kind of more ground level focus we'll say of of the set um there's a lot of just random cheap figures like low point figures that could be squeezed onto a lot of teams i, th I think that set actually is very very good oh yeah absolutely um, and not even just at the you know high hitters that people think of just like you know filling out like a keyword there's a few <laughs> things that like always catch like the right keyword in that set and, and then, then um two figures I, I never actually said it uh two oh, yeah. figures that i think uh i mean i definitely agree sky tyrant um if you don't think sky tyrant's gonna be on at least six of the top eight then you haven't been paying attention to hero clicks at all for the last four months um i don't necessarily think we'll see a lot of actually secret six teams i do think that if we do see high secret six representation it'll be probably more monster teams um and then um another figure that i think we will see a lot of is um oh, oh my god uh I mean, obviously Dark Phoenix, right? But um, the the other one I had in mind was... Um, I think Dooms are going to be... Yeah, thank you. Possibly. <laughs> yeah. the, I, I think that we'll see a lot of Dooms. Um, I think we talked about um, what have people actually been getting their hands on physically and collecting, right? I think a lot of people got the Dooms just because, like, oh my god, they're Dooms. They're cool. And a lot of people are probably very itching to... Um, let their dooms stretch their legs after spending, you know, what is it like five, six hundred dollars for the set? Oh yeah, yeah, and it's it does yeah. well. Like the you know the the great oh, very combo good. of doom, the right combo of dooms does very well um, in the right matchups. It's kind of crazy it's something how that you can how do much very can well. Off. You can do very well against the secret six teams with them too. That helps a lot. Like yeah, even though secret six teams apparently aren't being played a whole lot. A lot of people are afraid of them because you you do have to like keep mind. Well, what if I do play against the secret six team that can have full map reach and you know ping me from a heavy object and I can't equip anything and um and you know commissioner makes them double tap me on their biggest hitter and you know all of this stuff. Like, yeah. What do I do against that? I I got to be able to do something. Just like uh, Unimind back in 2017 2018 used to be the team to beat. Uh, Secret Six, even if it doesn't show up locally, it's still a threat out there. It's still something that sure. you have to calculate for. Uh, I think Sky Tyrant and <coughs> Scarab and oh, well, Scarab too. The, Commissioner, those are the big for, three. Commissioner for twenty five points is one of those <laughs> things where it's like if you have that leftover and you're not theme, like that is the best, probably the best yep. twenty five point piece in modern. Pretty um, close, Same. you know. Dark Phoenix for thirty points, really solid. For exactly well. twenty five, like, yes. I, yeah, yeah. If you're ex if you're talking exactly twenty five, because um, yeah, there's there's stuff that's great at like fifteen, stuff that's great at thirty, uh, but specifically twenty five, it's like Fulcum or Commissioner. And honestly, between the two, I'm gonna go with Commissioner because he's a better offensive piece, whereas uh, Fulcum has to be. You know, it's a retaliation only at 25, so... They could... We don't need to just hammer on Commissioner forever, because... But um, they seriously could have made that a 50-point figure, and I'd still be like, man, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah, if it was just his 50-point line. Uh, they needed to make at least one of the Secret Six cheaper so they could make the terrible ones fit on a team with it. Um <laughs> But yeah, uh, and then as far as silver goes, because there's going to be a silver event, there's also uh, some sort of like friendly something or other event. I can't remember exactly what, but the main event. I know there's wise, a lot of battle royales and stuff. Yeah, uh, main event wise, they've got Team Sealed, um, the Modern 300, and then I believe Silver is the third uh, main event. Uh, as far as that goes, my guess is as far as what is going to be shown in Silver um, Unimind has not gotten that much worse. The fact that Unimind can't perplex damage is slightly worse, but hardly like makes a difference. You could build around that if you wanted to. I still think Anarchy from Joker's Wild is one of the best control pieces for board. Uh, like any kind of map doesn't really matter what your opponent puts you on or what you put them on. 
anarchy can really just wreck your opponent's strategy whether they want to come to you really quick or whether they're like one of those barrier kind of teams it just kind of really destroys what they want to do um and then on top of that i think krakoan revival with being able to reach all the way back uh in silver not all the way back but a little ways back in silver i think krakoan revival gets a lot better and same with mission points i think there's going to be at least a couple. I know Calder's running a Mission Point Silver team, but I think it's actually a pretty solid play because of all the options that you have in Silver. Um, specifically Silver. I don't I don't think it works quite as well in Modern, but... yeah, Not yet. Right, not yet. We'll just when, have to wait when until When Mission Empire Points becomes like really good, when it becomes really good in Modern, it'll be like the most broken thing you've ever seen. And then they'll I have think, to like uh, ban stuff. The War of the Realms set that they announced, I think that is the one that's going to make mission points um, too good, and they'll have to change something about it, or they'll have to issue an errata on a figure. That's just my guess. I have no reason to think that, but yeah. I th- I think once they've done something three times, they get a little too lax, and then they, they slip up. So that's my guess. Uh what I think we'll see in Silver Age, it's, it's so big it's hard to say specific figures, right? Um, Unimind, I haven't, I haven't, I don't have the ban list memorized for the format, but um, if it's legal, then people will play it. <laughs> I actually um, think, I, don't, I can't remember. He was, he was like optioned as a possible ban for the like because right. I know it was him, Goblin King. There's a few things that can pick certain amounts of powers that make them almost impossible to get through their dial in like a 50 minute time limit. And I know I know Goblin King was out. Um, I can't remember. I am concerned that we may see a lot of don't die, which would actually bode very well for Calder for his team. But um... right, yeah, yeah. That's actually yeah. It's not a bad deal if like he just keeps boosting you know he doesn't have to be super aggressive as long as he just keeps uh pumping out bystanders to ko and interestingly because i think we'd see a lot of don't die and a lot of the best things in the format especially if you're digging backwards are things that have like really crazy you know special powers and things like that and they're good not because of their numbers but because of the very unique thing they bring to the table I actually think that Secret Six is better in Silver than it is in Modern. I can agree with that, yeah. Especially because like, it gets around a lot of protection that people aren't expecting to have to, you know, it's like, oh, well, this, this thing is fine. It has power cosmic. I don't need to worry about whatever. And then it's like, oh, well, you do. Yeah. So when they, when they first announced Silver as a format, my mind immediately went to uh, Secret Wars Battle World Odin who he's one of the uh, Avengers 10 million BC when he's next to you, like an opposing character. They can't be healed to use stop clicks or use protected outwit on his lower dial, I think a 120. Um, he also has outwit printed, and he has a once per game use a ranged attack with like eight range or something like that, which is really hard to do with like the kind of play that I make with him. But I, my Silver Age team would be something like Odin Overdrive as like my taxi something I don't know like uh, Medusa or Guy Gardner something that's like a good drop off bystander generation because then all you have to do is carry Odin up out whatever their top defense is doesn't matter if they have stop clicks because Odin gets rid of that and then you just hit him for a lot I played it with a in a four hundred setting, four hundred point setting with um, Avengers, and I had Steve Rogers make Triple H an Avenger, and then Triple H gives everyone for forty points gives everyone with the shared keywords, uh, empower. So Medusas were hitting for like six, or like the hairs were hitting for six, because uh, they like all the Medusas had empower, Odin had empower. Voyager had in power. That's how I played it originally. And it just, like, anything with a stop click as its main defensive thing just gets wiped. Like, you just hit it for, like, seven damage, and it's just gone. Uh, 
But silver allows for like so much weird stuff like that that it's really hard to pin down what's going to be in the top eight because you could have something that is don't die tech that doesn't use stop clicks like uh, Danger Room kind of style stuff. Or Lockjaw. Or Lockjaw. And Odin doesn't do anything to like help that or to like destroy that. But then alternatively, you could have something like a Danger Room guy going up against a, an Anarchy and your Danger Room Magneto takes like three damage from an air anarchy bomb and he doesn't just take the one damage because that's not coming from an opposing attack so you know he takes the full three and all of a sudden he's down dial and he's almost dead and if he takes another bomb he's just gone uh, so it's weird it's real weird it, it depends heavily on which matchups go up against which but uh yeah it's a very interesting event i'll be most interested in silver Modern, I kind of, like, no matter what wins, I'll be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but Silver, it'll be interesting to see, like, what the top eight was and which the bra- like what breakdown in the bracket, if there was any, like, rock, paper, scissors kind of stuff going on in there. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to see the teams. I am hopeful that there will be variety, and but at the same time, I'm, I'm prepared to be disappointed. <laughs> I always... I always prepare myself to be disappointed when it comes to hero clicks. Uh, that's just the best course of action. But that'll round up news. And so now it's time to get into kind of, sort of, some new clicks on the block. So, you screwed up. You know what you did was wrong. The question is, how are you going to make things right? Maybe you were trying to be cool. You take it from a guy who's been frozen for 65 years. The only way to really be cool is to follow the rules. The last thing you said before that is almost a new clicks on the block take. Just prepare yourself to be disappointed with hero clicks. <laughs> that is so you're new you're new to the game. Prepare to be disappointed with hero clicks. Uh right off the bat, just always um not really, but kind of. Um so inside the Discord we had a very interesting topic come up, and I'm sorry that most of you listeners probably would never uh, even like if you joined the Discord, it'd be kind of hard to track down. But we're going to bring it to you in audio format as best as we can. And so this is something that I was kind of aware of, but not not nearly as aware of as Alex here. So I just to preface this, I did judge for a venue for a little while. And judging for a venue does not necessarily mean that you are like a quote-unquote Hero clicks judge. So let me explain the difference. Judging for a venue means that you typically host events. You post what the builds are going to be, um, when they're going to be. You talk with the store and like the store managers and let them know like what kind of stuff that like, you're going to be ordering. What like the the you know the group. You're essentially the hero clicks voice to the store for your group, and you're the voice from the store back to your group. You're like the the go-between for those kind of things. As a Heroclix judge at a venue, that's essentially your role. Um, you do kind of need to know how to play the game. I would suggest that you know how to play the game to be a Heroclix judge in this capacity. But uh, being like the, the best Heroclix judge, uh, like a WizKids official kind of judge, isn't necessary for this role. You just have to have like good uh, interesting kind of builds that you post. You have to know what like your players kind of want. Um, at one point, my venue went from I think eight players showing up regularly under one judge to just me and that judge showing up. So it went from War of Light, the end of War of Light, where we had like eight to ten people to couple years later where it was just me and the judge because a lot of people just dipped out after War of Light and just stopped finding the game interesting or started playing something else or got too busy, whatever it was. Um, but that's just a, a big preface. So if you happen to be one of those kind of judges where you're not necessarily the best rules savvy guy, but you're like, you can look them up, that kind of thing. And you're mostly just in charge of hosting interesting events and that kind of thing. Uh, this is to kind of give you an idea of 
I don't know, Alex, would you, would you say like a kind of like a better way to placate to more players? Uh, that, that's part of it. Um, a lot of what, we're, what I'm going to be talking about has to do with event organization, uh, what that means for a store. It could be for, you know, um, if, if you have, so obviously I'm the manager for a store that we do hero clicks, um, I can organize events. Not every store does it that way. Sometimes they have a person who is not employed by the store organize events. Uh, some things will be different uh, depending on that store's situation. But generally speaking, uh, you want those the store and the organizer should be in communication to do things that work best for both of them, right? And a lot of... Um, the thing that prompted this was there was a post that circulated that said the quickest way to kill a hobby is for the veterans to be total jerks to the newbies. If you want things to flourish, you have to invite and encourage new folks getting into it. And, I mean, that's that's one of those things that you say it and you're like, well, duh. But there's a lot of things that go into that. They get a lot sketchier, not sketchier, but less defined when um, when you look at populations as a larger amount. And stores have to balance that, and event organizers has, have to balance that, and that's that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, so that, that's that's fair because I mean, as somebody that's tried to bring multiple people into the game, it is a very fine line of making, like, as a you know somewhat veteran player, making the game challenging enough where the person wants to get better and wants to learn more and wants to keep coming back. And making the game fun enough where, like, they're not, like, soul-crushingly just, like, going home in defeat and being like, well, I'm never trying that again kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. It is a fine line. Plus, it's hard to get everyone in the same venue on the same track. Um, I know at one of my venues, we kind of have, like, the trainee. like the, We've got, like, the people who are willing to play against newer players and who not only are willing to play against them, but are they're like good trainers for newer players. They'll teach them how to have fun with the game and they, you know, they won't just like destroy them on the offset kind of thing. And then we've got a few people that are just, you know, they just kind of play the way they play no matter who they're playing and whether they're destroying a new person or an older like player or like whatever, it's just this, the way they play. And that's just how it is kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I understand the, like the dichotomy between trying to have some like trying to have older players teach newer players and not everyone's the same when it comes to this game. Yeah, and so a lot of that um from a store perspective um and this is true in not just hero clicks, this is if if you're a store or a venue or whatever or even just a group of friends that get together every Saturday for whatever games, whether it be card games, board games, hero clicks, combination. Um, you need to understand that people enjoy things for different reasons. And from a store perspective, I, I know, I, I know I shouldn't be saying this, but our objective is to make money, right? Um, and part of that involves people being in the store and, and buying things and having a good time. But people enjoy things for different reasons, and people define a good time as different things. The um, So Wizards of the Coast, the company that makes Magic the Gathering, they developed a set of uh, player psychographics. So a psychographic is a marketing term. Uh, by the way, my, my degree is I, I have a bachelor's degree with a thumb a major in marketing and a minor in management. And so this is all kind of married together in that. Um, psychographics are a marketing concept where basically you can, sometimes you have a product or an idea for a product and you want to sell it, but you need to know who is going to buy it. Um, and you can adjust either the development or advertising or whatever of the product in order to fit that. So you create a fictional person that sort of represents who you're selling to. So that way it's easier to make those decisions because you can go, oh, what does fictional person, um, what would they think of this change? That's what a psychographic is. So um, Wizards of the Coast created various psychographics 
for um, people that play their games. And uh, just a real quick rundown, I promise, I know this is a lot of talking about stuff that's not Heroclix, but it'll make discussing the Heroclix things a lot easier. Uh, so there are uh, people that, uh, the psychographics that care about why people enjoy the game, and then there's aesthetic profiles that care about what they enjoy of the game, um, which I'll explain that. But um, the first psychographic is a Timmy or a Tammy. They like to do really big, like, show-stopping plays, right? Um, not necessarily complicated, but big. And so in Magic, that means, like, casting really big spells that do a lot all at once. Um, in Heroclix, maybe that's, like, a tentpole team or something of that nature, or they're like, oh, yeah, I, yes, I have my, my um, thousand-point colossal that I will put on the board, and you have to try to stop me. Things like that. Um, there are Johnnies and Jennies, which are kind of combo players. So uh, for Hero Clicks, it's kind of hard to like assemble a combo because we start the game more or less with, with everything that we have all the time. So it's kind of hard to make an analogy. Um, but, you know, maybe you have... I think um, the, like, mission points Ares is kind of... Yeah, is, yeah we do have tools for that now. On. Yes. You can build yep, for have, it, but, yeah. That's recent, but yes. Um, so, yeah, mission, mission points are a great example for this, actually. Yep. Uh, there are spikes. Now, spike is where a lot of people, at least in community discussions, this is where, with hero clicks, a lot of people run into issues. Um, especially for new players. A spike is a person who they derive their enjoyment of playing whether whether it be a particular game or any game or not even games, um, just anything in their life from winning. If they're not winning, they're not having fun. That doesn't mean that their strategy has to be fun or enjoyable or even remotely um, interesting. It could be the most boring strategy in the world and but if it wins they're that's where they're happiest um and then and then there's um the aesthetic profiles there's um uh, true crime now. we call a a spike a product killer because <laughs> <laughs> it's not the process of killing someone that enjoys them it's a it's what they get out of it yes and similarly most spikes are sociopaths. No, no, I'm sorry. I that was completely <laughs> that was out of line. Uh, but that's just where my brain went. A Mel, or which is short for Melvin or Melanie, is someone who cares about mechanics. So um, maybe you don't care about building the most comic accurate team, or it's like, well, I have Superman on this team with um, Leonardo from TMNT. Does it make sense? No. Does it need to? No, they do this cool thing. Um, and then there's a Vorthos, which is someone who focuses on flavor. So, you know, maybe you want to force, or not force, but if you want to use lots of um, team-ups that have happened in actual things, or if you want to build a team based on, like, oh, I want to build a theme team around WandaVision, you can do that. So those are all the different things. Um, the reason they all matter as I mentioned, stores need to um, want want to have people in their store. Now, maybe different businesses have different strategies, right? So maybe um, your your venue is you want to have as many people in there all the time. Uh, you want to fill all those seats. You want them buying whatever, whether it be normal, you know, game product or snacks, or maybe um, maybe you're like um, Lucky Dice Cafe and you, you sell food. Uh, if you have lots of people hanging out in your store all day, guess what? They're going to buy food. It's a good strategy, yeah, yeah. If you're gaming all day, you've got to replenish the fluids and uh, the calories that you're exerting. So I know when I go to my, no my local venue, it's always at least one drink and usually like two snacks. Like peanut butter crackers are my go-to and a Gatorade kind of thing. Um, but yeah, like any... Any money generated in that aspect is something the store is looking for, yeah. For sure. So so for places that want to do that, they want to make sure that they can get as many people in the store as possible. Um, and obviously that 
requires having events that aren't going to try to push people away. Now, you never want to have events that push people away. It's less about um, curating the people that you have in the store and more about finding ways to um, incentivize people to be in the store. Now, you can incentivize them for different reasons and with different things. Um, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about is easy to think like, oh, well, we don't want these people in the store. No, no, we want them in the store, but we need to encourage them in order to do the things that we want, if that makes sense. So if, if your goal is to have as many people in the store as possible, you need to organize events in such a way that you're not discouraging people or that you are encouraging as many people as you can. So uh, lots of places do this with, um, well, there's casual night or there's, um, you know, an event where you, you have to play with these various restrictions and things of that nature. We essentially, we don't want to make our venue just a casuals only kind of venue. Uh, right. Because the spikes are just as important as like the mills. Uh, we, we, you know, we want the people that have interesting builds and interesting ideas and stuff to feel as good about playing as the people that are in it to win it kind of thing. Um, and similarly, like the people that just want to see like a thematic kind of battle happen, we want them to have a place just as much as everyone else as well. So we have to kind of like marry all of these ideas, not necessarily at the same time, but in like the same venue while not like not making it like a prescription where it's like this is the venue for strictly casual play for like just like only fun happens here you know kind of thing because uh, then we we essentially limit the venue to what kind of community it can have and uh, that's slightly detrimental to the community at large um, but essentially to the venue the venue loses whatever kind of money they would have gotten right. from those players. So to add to that, um, it's easy for a lot of, and I've seen stores do this, and usually they close. Um, for, for reference, our store has been in business for 30 years. Um, the I've seen lots of places do things like, oh, well, we want to cater to this specific customer because they spend, that's the segment of that market that spends the most money on this thing. It's, it's not a secret that people that grind competitive Heroclix events probably individually buy way, way more product than, you know, casual person. You know, maybe the casual person buys four packs of a set. Maybe they buy a brick. Maybe a competitive grinder buys six cases, right? It's, it's a pretty big difference, but as far as the population of them, I mean, there's, I could spend a lot of time talking about whether you want to, um, you know, just go for big individual customers that earn their loyalty for long-term stuff compared to having a widespread. There's a lot, I could, I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but that's not what I'm here for. Um, right. I think uh, Critical Clicks, maybe like an episode or two ago, mentioned how, um, like the super fan, um, idea where some companies go after fans of their product and then other companies go after like they, they disregard like a huge percentage of the community just to get those those super fans those people that like are on brand for life kind of people yeah the example they used was Burger King yeah which is I mean, um, I mean fair uh, I still think Burger King is better than McDonald's in every possible way um, and to be fair, I also think that Burger King probably has better beef than anything produced in South Dakota. So there's also that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> he'll just be livid when he hears it and he can't do anything about it. That's the best part. That's the best part for me. <laughs> uh. Um, yeah, um, right. So if you're just going after, you know, whales, essentially, that's great as long as they stay involved. But um, you, it's, you have to worry about longevity. But um, so you and you can you can do both. You can do both. And 
a lot of that has to do with, as I had said, encouraging people to come out for things for the right reasons as opposed to forcing or punishing them for doing bad things. Um, so I generally don't like events where it's like, okay, well, you have just crushed everyone here for the last month with Unimind. We're going to ban Unimind. I don't like that. Um, that is feel bad for the person who enjoys Unimind, whether it be for spike reasons or maybe they just enjoy what the figure does. They think it's cool. Maybe for whatever reason they have a real attachment to the character of Unimind. Um, I know that if, if I was playing somewhere and someone said, hey, the best Doctor Strange ever made, we're going to ban it now. I'd be I'd be pretty upset. <laughs> um, but um, I had notes. Where did they go? It's probably, so, I mean, if they were going to ban a Doctor Strange... It would probably be the D twenty one. That's the closest it is very to Faust. Good. He's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, in in management, there is um, something called theory X versus theory Y management. Uh, theory, and and this is I mean it's quote management, but it's more of any kind of communication or relations to people. Um, being a judge for any game is really about communicating half of the job is all about de-escalating issues and conflicts. Um, obviously, game knowledge matters for making rulings, but, for example, um, if I'm I'm judging... I've judged Magic tournaments way bigger than any HeroClick stuff we've done, but um, I've, I've judged Magic tournaments with over 200 people in them and for our store, and... Probably half of the judge calls I would get during those kinds of events are not about a rules question at all. It's, hey, we have a disagreement about what happened. Help us come to the solution of what happened. And a lot of that has to do with making sure that both players understand what's expected, that they agree with the outcome, and that they understand how we got there. So... That applies universally to all of this. The so it's, um, it's kind of like be a judge and show your work kind of thing. So like, as far as like, if it was like a math yes. problem, it would be like you have to show your work. You can't just be like uh, the rules say this guy is correct. The guy on the right is correct. You have to like show your work and uh, walk them through it, as it were. Yes. So, with um, conflicts of a player just keeps soul-crushing people, you want to find ways to make that player understand without, um, without attacking or belittling or making them feel like they're being punished for enjoying a game. Because to them, they are enjoying it. So the easiest way to... I'm getting ahead of myself. So th theory X and theory Y. That's that's the um, theory X is basically about people are motivated by um, avoiding bad things. So theory X management says that um, I'm not going to do this because if I do, I will be punished for it. Theory Y management is says that people are motivated by positive things that they can work towards. Um, examples for this in in HeroClip stuff can be price structure, right? Um, so if you have price structure that's not just about winning, uh, maybe it's fellowship rewards, maybe it's, um, for example, uh, Simeon, when you ran your, your Prince format, uh, you had the, the special prize for, um, what was it, the person that had the most expensive team? Yes, that was the original in intent. Uh, what ended up happening because of tournament layout uh it ended up be it's just being a uh a like losing bracket versus winning bracket and the losing bracket also got prized but the original intent was going to be uh fellowship got paid out to whoever had the most expensive team which was yeah that was the the whole point of like the tournament was just who can have the most ridiculously expensive team and i think we capped out around is like thirteen hundred and ninety six dollars or something like that. It's almost fourteen hundred dollar team. Yeah. 
Um, to be fair, they didn't have to prove that they owned the figures, but yes, uh, yeah. Um, to go along with this, uh, the Hero Clicks for Huntington's the Silver Age event, Family is Everything event that Scott Porter hosted. Um, what was it? It was a prized out for worst luck for most thematic uh, runner up for most thematic and then I can't remember there was a fourth one where it was yeah it was like another fellowship prize um, for like probably like nicest player because I think Emily won that one Uh, but (laughs) nicest player overall Um, but yeah so yeah those, those fellowship prizes uh, and uh, going along with that, PJ on the offset before the event even popped up, PJ Boland said he wasn't even going to like he wasn't going in it to win. He was going for one of like the like the fellowship prizes. He said he was trying to get one of the fellowship prizes with his team. So yeah, like it definitely motivated him to build not for the meta slightly out of like the meta competitive kind of stuff that he could have done and try something that he probably wouldn't have otherwise and uh he ended up doing pretty okay with it anyhow but yeah he also got like a runner-up for best theme kind of prize or most family thematic prize right now so some people will look at those and go eh i still just want to win but you're at least uh, giving them encouragement towards maybe not being so soul crushing and kind of dicks about it um, um, and, and more importantly, it gives the other players who maybe, you know, lose a bunch, it gives them opportunities to still get something out of it, um, find some way to um, still feel like their time is being spent in a constructive, worthwhile, and hopefully enjoyable way. Now, if you have a really large attendance, say 24 plus people for an event, for Hero Clicks, that's pretty big. Um, you need you don't need to worry so much about all of this because you know when you have enough rounds in an event the people that are playing you know spike to win they'll float to the top and play with each other and the people that are looking to get enjoyment out of the game in other ways they'll you know float not to the top and they'll play with each other um, and they can still win stuff with these extra prizings fellowship whatever um, our events um, when, I mean, obviously, we're not, I already said we're not doing events right now, but when we were, we were pretty consistently having, like, six to eight people. Um, we would, or, of course, order the um, organized play kits from through Alliance from WizKids. Everyone would get um, something from the promo box, whether they won every game, whether they won no games, they could have never KO'd a figure, they would still win something. And the entry fee was also um, just buy a pack. So, you know, probably doing something they're already going to do, and pricing was pretty flat. There was a couple packs put on top, but this made it so like you wouldn't feel compelled to go out and you know put together the strongest team you could possibly play, but you still you know would want to have a good team, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, no one likes losing. Obviously, you know, you could be you could be the least spiky person alive. You're still not gonna like losing all the time. But, especially um, not in like a not in like a especially like if you I lose built to the really same casually people every week and then just got like wrecked in like the first two turns kind of way cuz that's a, that's my big thing whenever I play is like I usually make a team and the team has like I have one goal I want to get one thing done and you die before you can even and start and like yeah if if my opponent kills me before I can activate or do like the one fun thing that my team does that it just leaves like a real bad taste in like your mouth. Um, My favorite magic deck does have a thing where, um, on occasion, if I get a really lucky hand, I just kill people. I I could literally kill you on turn two, which is yeah. really fast for magic. And um, I, for the, it depends a little bit on the context of where I'm playing. Like if I'm playing in a competitive event, like uh, whatever, I'm fine with it. But if I'm playing, you know, weekly Friday night magic. I, I apologize to my opponents when it happens. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, when Vulture first, like when that was first legal, 
because uh, Vulture and Auk Arms were both like that was the same set, so it became like the the infinite chain became apparent almost immediately when that set was legal. Um, there was a lot of tournaments. Uh, I want to say like at least three tournaments where people still hadn't caught on to just how you know like maybe they got like knocked down into like a a lower like Swiss pairing and they didn't see any vultures but once they finally did once they like once someone finally realized like oh if i let this pop off i just like lose it just like ends the game that was pretty new to hero clicks like a lot of hero clicks like you know it would be kind of like a timeout scenario where like you would just like wait your opponent out or you would overwhelm them with force or like you know like but at any point, they would feel like they kind of had a chance. Vulture was, like, the very first thing that I ever experienced in Heroclix, and I think a lot of people ever experienced in Heroclix, where it was, like, once it started popping off, you realized you had no chance. It was, like, unless my opponent crit misses, like, multiple times, I am just done. But, yeah, like, that was the first tournament I ever ran that in. Um was probably like the least fun build I ever did because I had to explain to so many people why they were about to like lose just so poorly and just like be like, I'm very sorry, but I built this team explicitly knowing that like a lot of you wouldn't understand how exactly it works. So here's what's about to happen. And then it just like, you know, turn to the game's over and they're just like, well, that was mean and I'm like yes yes it was but that's luckily that was only tournament play so that was not uh, like an every week kind of thing right oh I'm sorry to have to interrupt you real quick Alex uh, sounds like we've got an important update what could it possibly be see I think this update's got you know a grain of truth it's got uh, what is lost. It's got some Redanian intelligence, luckily. Uh, these, of course, are all episode titles. Um, Care Morin, one of my favorite episodes that is soon to be released. I uh, haven't seen it, so I, I can't actually say that's my favorite episode. But luckily, this episode also, this, uh, this update also comes with uh, some interesting character development, such as Vesemir finally being unlocked. Great, great character that we've got there. Uh, Philippa Eilhart, as well as, you know, you can't have Philippa without Dijkstra. Of course, the Redanian intelligence must be their, their episode, of course. Um, but no, uh, I'm finally, you know, we're finally going to see some Kaer Morin. We're going to see some real interesting stuff and then on top of all of that Vesemir's got his own little animated series also coming out so that's going to be great and uh, this has been your week's worth of Witcher nonsense updates because Calder wasn't here to stop me so with that back to the hero clicks I said all of that to basically say uh, try to encourage people to do things that you want them to do but not everyone's going to do that right um, so what do you do when you have a, a problematic personality that is um, other people are having less fun at the expense of their own fun. Yeah. We'll just call it a, like a KN for like an acronym that makes sense. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm just K, never going to let KN, you do the show without them ever again. The KN personality. Uh Clearly, no one would have those those initials. So, yeah, like this this awful KN personality that's ruining everyone's day. How do we deal with them? Uh, so obviously, um, it it depends on who you are relative to the situation. Like, I'm not saying that like if you are you know a, a random person. Not to say that anyone is a random person. Everyone is important. But um, you're all special in your own special way. But uh, the um. If, if you're just, you know, a customer at a store, maybe don't walk up to the person and be like, hey, that's that's not going to help anything. <laughs> um, now, maybe you can bring those concerns to the store, to the judge. Uh, we started this conversation with Simeon explaining that judges are sort of liaisons between 
a lot of time, a lot of times liaisons between a venue and the players in the venue. Um, and I talked about how a lot of judging is conflict de-escalation. Let judges do their job, um, and let stores take care of things in their store. Now you can you can help them with that as a non-judge, non-store employee. You can present information to them. You can. Uh, create the space for them to talk to the people they need to talk to. And you can do this without um, trying to muscle people out of the store, which which no one wants. I mean, we're all here, as I said many times, to have fun, even if people have fun in different ways. We all want Hero Clicks to be the biggest game in the world or the big two games in the world, right? And it can go both ways, even if you're not realizing that's what's happening. Now, if that's if you're a person that, that isn't really in a position to in, enforce changes. If you are in that position, uh, you should talk to the, the problematic player, but not in front of everybody else. You don't want to give space for them to feel um, embarrassed or um, for things Defensive. to escalate in other right. ways. Yep. Yeah. You don't need to give someone a reason to be like defensive, and the easiest way to give someone a reason to be extremely defensive is if there's like a if there's an audience to yes, like you know, it's very and, and hard you already know in that human that, nature. Like, let's say I'm the problematic player, and someone, you know, the store employee or the judge or whatever, walks up to me, you know, just after I, you know, um. Giganta retaliate, double token, whatever, uh, my opponent. Um, and they're like, hey, why do you got to be so mean to them? I already know that the person sitting across from me is probably not on my side. So um, don't, don't do it in front of everybody else. Find an opportunity. And if, and if players are kind of pushing for you to, like, hey, you got to deal with this, um, make sure you communicate to them uh you know, you I will, um, but there there is a time and place for this conversation. Don't worry, it will be taken care of. They need to, you know, believe you that, <laughs> that you need to make sure that they are assured that um, things will be dealt with. Because if they don't believe that, and obviously you have to live up to that end of the deal, but if they don't believe that, then they're not going to want to come to your store. And then if you make other people feel unwelcome, then through basically being like, hey, stop doing this thing that you like to do, then they're not going to want to come to your store. Now, obviously, this is all asterisk. There are some behaviors that it's like, no, I don't want that behavior in my store ever. Those are the people you kick out of the store and ban for life. Right. That's not this, right? That's more of like <laughs> an, uh, an abusive to the person and not to the game. Uh, if you're if you're abusing right. actual people and instead of like game elements, then yes, that is like a... If you're abusing fleshy people instead of plastic people, that's where the line is drawn. <laughs> yep. Yes, exactly. Uh, Goldie Hawn, I have my eye on you. Um, no, but <laughs> <laughs> abusing plastic is a real crime. Um, no, like it's it becomes a very you have to be empathetic towards. So, like as a judge, if I was looking at this situation, I have to be empathetic towards the person that feels like they have been. Not necessarily like abused, but like they feel like they're not having fun. And then I also have to be empathetic towards the person that is having fun, but at the expense of of someone else's enjoyment. And so I have to I have to balance these two things. I have to not call the person out in front of other people because that at best they're gonna like double down on their like conviction. And be like, this is how I play. Like, you can't tell me like I can't play like this. It like fits the rules that you said. You know, at best, that's what's going to happen. At worst, they're going to take like a into whole the, the segment of thing. your yeah. yeah you're they're going to take like whole segment of your uh, community away. You know, like let's say like this is a uh, a spike like you know like a competitive player versus a like extremely casual com- like player kind of situation. I don't want to drive all the spikes out of my store because they are like a, you know, even if they're like a smaller population of my store, they are a population of my store. And I do want, especially in Heroclix where we 
so like rarely have high turnouts for like a lot of these smaller events i want as much turnout as i can get and i know that the competitive players tend to turn out in higher numbers for like events more often than anyone else just because right. like and, and whether it's prizing or not but um yeah i, I don't want to drive those guys away so getting them like one-on-one -on -one, it puts them in a I'm not going to say like safer space, but it, it's a more controlled environment where uh, you can be slightly more vulnerable than when you're like in front of other people. Because when you're in front of other yeah. people, whether you like it or not, you're kind of like on display and you're kind of putting on like a facade of who you truly are. And when you're a competitive player, you kind of have to, you know, you have to be like, well, like I... I deserve to win because like I, you know, I built according to your rules and like, you know, like whatever kind of stuff. And like, you're going to like miss the point of why you're being. Asked and, there, and there's some and events like that. where that's going to happen. Um, and you, sometimes you just have to understand that that'll happen and you have to be okay with it, but you need to make sure that you have enough other events where that isn't going to happen, that um, everyone's okay. And, you know, it's okay to have not, it's harder if you have a smaller community, but it is okay to have different events that are catered to different people as long as that is properly communicated essentially what it's for. Now, I'm not going to, you know, make an event listing and say spikes only. That doesn't make any sense. But right. it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at an event with a $30 entry and prizes worth, you know, hundreds of dollars to go, oh, well, maybe if I've never you know played in a competitive event that's you know of anything of this caliber then you know unless it's something i'm really looking to kind of push towards maybe this isn't the event for me well in like a weekly event um like every so often like i wouldn't say once a month because here locally it, it i think it was more close to like once every three months we would have like a uh 300 modern it would just be called like 300 modern practice and it was usually on like the build up for like a larger event either like at our store or like uh you know close to our store like uh, stayed and, away or whatever and this um, is why i'm a big fan of sealed for bigger prize events yeah because um you you can't you, there's nothing you can do and nothing you need to do about making sure that people don't build to be oppressive because everyone gets the same thing. Right. Even if, like, you pull oppressively, it's just like, well, that's, like, the luck of the cards kind of thing. Um, there's no way to limit what kind of, like, lucky pull someone can get. Um, yeah, I I was never, like, truly, like, I was never a fan of the, the 300 modern practice nights. But at the same time it's kind of like a necessary thing to have every now and then because you'll have, you know, you'll have your, like your good players at the venue who show up with like casually competitive kind of teams. They can hold their own. They've got good tactics. They've got like, you know, these ideas that work well, but sometimes they're not like fully versed in what is like 300 competitive. And so they won't have like the full sideline. They won't have like all of the, like the tactical knowledge and so when they like they like come up to the like, 300 modern, it's good um, to kind of like showcase like what can happen. And uh, I think me and Calder like touched on it a, like a while back when um, I mentioned how like a newer player had been playing for about four months, decided to jump into a WKO, like one of like one of the local venues. He had gotten pretty comfortable. And he'd kind of figured out, like, what our local meta was. And without my knowledge, he had jumped into the WKO, and I just, like, saw him there. And I was like, oh. And he was like, yeah, like, I, you know, like, I've never played this piece because, like, I feel I felt like it was too good for, like, casual and stuff. But, like, I think it'll do really good and competitive. But he had never seen ID cards. He had never seen, like, retaliation Oof. because we didn't play those casually. You know, those were a very strictly, like, meta thing, and we never practiced meta at that venue. So he had a extremely rough awakening during that WKO because, like, you know, that was 
2019 when IDs were still legal. And it was just, you know, that's a huge wrench thrown into, like, your idea of how this game plays. So it it's not a bad thing uh, to lose handily like that. It is a terrible feeling when it's at a tournament and it's, like, five rounds of Swiss where each round you're just getting beat it's down by like a different thing that you've never heard of. It's like, so this is called Surter. He's going to smash you. Like, oh, okay. Uh, so this is called a Cyclops ID, you know, like, it's not fun, but if it was in a casual setting where it was, um, like a practice night and you like got it explained to you and you were like, okay, like, well here, like, this is what I would try and do to kind of like counteract it and like your opponent and you could like kind of walk through it as like a practice, like kind of thing. That's good. I, I like practice nights for that aspect. It's really good to bring casual players that are thinking about getting into the meta up to speed real quick um, without just doing, like, four hours of soul-crushing, you know, gameplay uh, with no idea of what's happening. Um, but, yeah, uh, back to what Alex was talking about, because this was kind of a long tangent. Back to what Alex was talking about... Um, Oh, actually, no, I, I just want to tack on to something there that you said. Um, you said that, you know, the practice nights, it's it's a lot better if you run into that and someone's able to sit there and explain it to you and you can kind of prepare. Um, that's one of the best things you can encourage someone who's insistent on being a spike to do. Um, you know, maybe, maybe they... Um, Maybe they soul press somebody, but then, you know, encourage them to, of, of course, stay friendly. But um, one, I'm, I, no one wants people to rub in a loss. Obviously, that's a different behavior that you need to talk to them about. But um, assuming it's just they win their games, they get their prizes, they leave. Um, maybe encourage them to, uh, to discuss the games with their opponent. I mean, not everyone is going to be in a mood after losing to, you know, listen to their opponent talk about why they lost. But if they're, if the person that lost is someone who's willing for that to happen, then uh, I find that that makes me feel a lot better about my losses too in events because I can get better. I can maybe learn on how to play against it. I can do all those things. Even in competitive events, my deck in Magic, I don't, for the record, I really do not play competitive level hero clicks. I realize there's a lot of dice mitigation and perplex and stat modifiers and stuff, but I don't have a lot of interest in playing a high-level competitive game with dice. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that right now. But um, in, in Magic, my, my deck that I play for competitive events is pretty complicated, and it's a deck that not a lot of people understand how a lot of the moving parts interact. So if I do beat somebody whether it be a close game or a bad game, a lot of times they'll ask me, you know, like, hey, do you, when I did this thing, do you think I should have done this thing instead? And we'll sit there and we'll, we'll talk about the game, even at, like I said, even at, like, the most competitive level of events, because, hey, guess what? My tiebreakers are based on them doing well. I want them to understand how my deck works, so if they play against it somewhere else, they can play against it better and win. Um... And so, and that also makes the loss feel, I mean, it's a little cheesy to say it, but like you take a bad situation and turn it into an opportunity and that can mitigate the sting. Yeah, that makes sense because no one likes being uh, timed out by like a Unimind that just popped a few things. But when you explain to them like, yeah, like, you know, because in hero clicks sometimes you just meet like the paper to your rock or like the scissors to your paper kind of situation sometimes you just happen yeah, it's, to and it's the best of one format so right yeah like you, you know you literally you have like a great tank team a team that's just super defensive and you just happen to go up against the team that like cracks that kind of defense but like you know, nine times like nine times out of ten, if that's the situation you're in, you're already on your way to being like a fairly decent competitive player if you want to be. You already kind of understand the game. Um, other times, it's like you know, 
your opponent has to explain to you, you know, like why, uh, like, well, when you flurried like this character, you should have realized like my retaliation was going to be able to like retaliate and like take out this character, that kind of situation. There's a lot of like minutia and like a lot of different moving parts in hero clicks, just like any competitive game. There's a lot of like different moving parts where it's the better, not necessarily the, but like the more you play, the more you'll understand how the game works and like, you'll never really be at like a perfect spot because the game's constantly evolving but you'll definitely be at like a more consistent spot where you like understand up to this point or you understand the majority of like this kind of game because like currently the way I feel is like I I understand the game pretty well up to like 2020 and then 2021 hit and I'm like uh, I don't I have yep. no clue what people are building with again like I'm in this like weird space again because I haven't been playing competitively. I haven't been playing in person where all of a sudden, once again, I'm like completely unaware of what people are playing and all these team builds keep popping up and I'm just completely confused as to like how they win and what their tactics are. But all it takes is playing like one game against those people, the people that like run those kind of teams and understanding it. And it's, you know, it's... uh you have to be okay with losing just as uh, like a lot of people are like, okay with winning. You have to take it in stride because I don't know. I think losing is, you know, it's just a huge part of the game for me, at least uh, probably the, the largest part of my game is losing. But uh, yeah, it's, I probably played hero clicks for eight months before I won a game at our weekly events. Yeah. That uh, that sounds that tracks. That's about like how well I did. I was, I played for quite a while until I finally like real like I find it never like truly clicked with me. It was never like a like eureka moment kind of thing. But there was a few times where I just had like a lucky build. You know, I just had the right synergy, and I was like able to capitalize. And then time got called at the right spot or whatever. Same. Yeah, I was able um, to win. Lucky build. So basically, I would always, I was always just throwing things that I thought, you know, were cool characters or cool, um, cool mechanics or things like that on the team without giving any thought to whether or not they worked together. And I just got lucky, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna take Undertaker, and I'm gonna take um, uh, XDPS Sabertooth and uh, this this other monster thing. I don't even remember what it was anymore. And they're, they're going to be on a team together. It turns out that that's when I learned, like, oh, yeah, this this charge flurry with these bonuses, that's pretty good. <laughs> and, um, and it made me think about, like, why the figures that I did well with did well. But, I mean, we're, we're digressing way too far from the point. I think the, like, main thing is that everyone kind of wants to do well with hero clicks, but at the same time, it's, like, a varying levels of how we want to do well. So... When it comes to me, like, I am perfectly fine with going on, like, a month-long stint of not winning. But there's clearly people that don't like that. And we have to kind of, like, mesh the whole, like, you know, as I've... We've already kind of said, we've the goal with this is to kind of mesh all of the groups together. We want a singular venue that can appeal to all the types of players. Um, we want the competitive players to have, like, a place... But we want that same place to be, you know, a place where casual, more casual kind of players can, like, work. And so, in a situation where we've got people that are constantly losing, that's not necessarily the worst thing. But we also kind of want to steer the, like, the more competitive people into, like, a direction where we're like, hey, have you thought about, like, kind of challenging yourself in, like, a different way? Like, you know, you know kind of like giving yourself a handicap is that kind of what you were thinking as far as like when you talk to them um yeah you can do that it's definitely i mean there's no one size fits all solution um depends a little bit on the context of the kind of events you're running hero clicks is a pretty unique game in in a lot of ways but um certainly in the way of it's it's the only it's definitely the only game that our store 
normally does events for where um, we make up the format or, you know, other people in the community make up the format. No other game does this on a regular basis. And that is kind of the, the norm for hero clicks. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, for, for the majority of like the hero clicks life, the onus um, is put upon the players and the community. Uh, so whether that be coming up with unique formats and ways to play or teaching new players, like it's very community driven, which I really love that aspect of hero clicks. And then at the same time, I'm like, I it does have some some hurdles, right? It does make it a lot harder for the community as a whole. Yeah. Um. So it also depends on the player, of course. You know, it's it's kind of up to you to use your judgment, look at the situation. You know, if it's re- repeat problems with this person, then it's, it's probably not going to help. Um. But uh, at the same time, and also again it ties back to prize support. If if the structure of the event does not support the idea of them handicapping themselves, making any kind of sense, then it's it's almost going to be an insult to ask. But um, so if if you think that the situation is one where that that could make sense, then certainly um you know maybe be like hey um you know you've played you've played I'll keep using Unimind as an easy example. You've played Unimind here every week for the last month. Um, what um. What other stuff do you like, or what what other things have you been itching to try out? Rather than just saying, "Hey, play something different," try to get them to think about on their own playing something different. Now, maybe that something different is something else just as oppressive, but I mean, you can try, right? Right. And um, um, or you know, uh, have you thought about? It? Of course, some of these conversations are a lot easier if you're very knowledgeable about the game. Not not even even judges that organize events aren't necessarily gonna. You know, maybe their forte isn't competitive team building, right? Um, but you know, if maybe if you have suggestions, if you can give suggestions to them, hey, what do you think about this kind of team? I've been thinking about, um, you know, building this, but I, I'm I'm not sure. Um, you know, I have you know these two hundred points that I think are like a good base, but I'm not sure what to do with the other hundred. Um, I'd, I'd like to see if you could come up with some ideas to try out. Um, if you can, if you can even like almost almost trick them into building for you, um, trick is a bad word for it, but but kind of, right? Um, then then something like that is a great way to encourage people to kind like of I'm break out of their shell. Tricking this person into being a nice, good human, um, but in reality, it's it's less of. It's not so much you're tricking them, and it's more... In, in, in a way, they also... It, I mean, it's not a obviously, if it's genuine, that's thing. all the better, right? If it's genuine, that's all the better. Right, because, but like... It, uh, they're also, like, helping you. Like, it, it gets them into that spirit and, and frame of mind as well. Yeah. So, like, I, I've i met very casually competitive players where in the casual environment and the casual constraints, they can be extremely oppressive at times but given like the full birth of like a meta casual or not meta uh, given the full birth of like a hero clicks meta kind of like situation these uh, casually competitive kind of players falter because you know they, they're they're good at being competitive in this like strict environment which is like cultured by you know no one at this like venue runs IDs. No one at this other venue runs colossal retaliators. So like they're very competitive and very capable in this kind of environment. And while I'm glad that they're not like a fully fledged competitive player in these casual like more casual venues, uh, at the same time, finding ways to get them to like build outside of like their kind of thing. So. Um, we like to do like higher builds like so like we yep. did a thousand point build and we had two people play full point unimind well like that was kind of gross <laughs> for what most of the other people were playing but then uh you know when uh WWE came out WWE wasn't like oppressive compared to like what was currently in Heroclix but it was new and it was hard for people to like figure out and stuff 
And so yeah, we ran a, a like a flyers only event. Like you had to have the flight symbol on your base. And that like, you know, that helped tone down like if anyone was going to run WWE, like they could maybe run like the WWE ring, but they couldn't run any of the characters, that kind of thing. Um really helps like shift people's like perception. And I think this is good for a competitive aspect as well because the the more you have to like struggle for a build, the more you'll see, you know, like you might run into a figure where you're like, oh, like I had never considered this for a competitive build before, but under these constraints, I had to use it. And it actually turns out like this kind of like ebb and flow of this team that I made could like actually work as like a competitive build for a tournament kind of thing. And I don't think that happens too often if you're in like a strictly competitive like we only play 300 modern venue but i also think those kind of venues are few and far between so um it's cool that like you know occasionally if those venues do exist like those kind of players do get to experience like oh like i never thought like multiple man would be good but like you know in this certain circumstance he is so i could see how like in like certain restrictions i can play him better kind of thing it helps everyone grow as like a player but i think yeah um interesting builds is in my opinion that's like the way i've always tried to get around this kind of thing you always like there's always going to be a best build for any kind of sure i I do uh, think if if you do limit builds um you can't limit them to uh, what's the, not that frequency isn't necessarily an issue if there's variety. So like you can't limit them too consistently um, because people do own. I mean, this is a collectible game where people like a lot of the things that they own and they own them for a reason. Especially if it's expensive, right? Like no one wants to buy a figure for possibly upwards a hundred or more dollars and then never use it. Um, right. We're not gonna do popper four weeks in a row. Right. And just like, so, like oh, you pulled if, the if chase. You, well, too bad. Like you don't get a. Play yeah, that too. Place. Like, like, like as a, as a store, we we want to sell product too, right? So like, if every week is popper, well, why would anybody buy sealed product to play at our store? Ever? Right. <laughs> yeah. If your if your only venue like only allows, um, like you can buy a cur of a set for. 40 to 60 dollars and your venue only allows comments and uncommons why would you ever pull from boosters i mean other than like the lottery aspect but like yeah there's no reason to like really pull from boosters and keep the product um if that's the situation because yeah like any super rares or chases that you have which that's another thing like um i know a lot of like newer players will kind of get the aspect of like uh like well it's just the chases and like super rares that always like beat me down. And while that can be true, it's also a misconception because there are like chases and super rares. Well, first of all, there's chases and super rares that aren't like they're not created equal. It's not every chase is like right. as good as another chase. But also in different hands, the same teams work completely differently. So like a, a a PJ Bolin, if you will, will handle a Secret Six team much better than like a uh, a Calder Ness, if you will. Um, just to, to two different tiers of players to like list random. I don't I don't even know if those are real people, but to list them out as if they were. Um, so yeah, like is PJ it's, Bolin, the same guy as PJ Bolan. <laughs> yes. Uh, PJ Bolan uh, to list out another character, Scott Cram, Company Crampton. Yeah, so people that are used to using these characters to their full extent are going to like have better ideas of how to position and better like game plans. So it's it's more like chess when it comes to that kind of situation where there is an end game that they are trying to get to a kind of positioning that they want to get to. Whereas in the hands of like an uncultured man like me, I'm going to try and slam my like sky tyrants into your characters as many times as possible and get as many points before you kill them. 
and that's like my whole goal. And so, if if you handed me Secret Six, I'd probably spend the first twenty minutes of the match rereading Scarab. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's like, so they have an object, I have a special object, I can copy my ob- yeah. Um, and that's time. Cool. We placed our teams. <laughs> But no, like, I mean, dooms are even worse because there's, I'd have to read every doom to be like, wait, which one do I want to start with? Oh no, which one do I want to switch to? Like that kind of thing. Um, but yeah. It's, That's why you just play um, Sorcerer Supreme Doom and never switch out and call it today. <laughs> never bother switching out, yeah. Um, Prisoner of Planet Doom was like the one that I was like, man, this is insane. How will anyone not play this? And then no one played it because that's that's how i work when i think of good things uh but yeah i think uh when it comes to like building competitively you can have like you can net deck and you can build like really solid teams but it still takes a skilled pilot to run net decked or you need to understand teams you need to understand why the team why the figures are on the team together I mean, like, Absolutely. it doesn't take a lot to go, oh, well, this is my primary attacker, and hey, they're doing melee attacks, and oh, this has a power. They probably want to stand next to each other. Right. But there's and lots even... of times where there's abilities that even, it, less so now that we can't push to clicks, but um, there's lots oh, of sure. situations where you have, like, weird interactions, or, or maybe you have an equipment and you're not actually sure who's supposed to equip it, or things like that. But even, like, even beyond that, like, uh, mid-game positioning you know like the so like you might like figure out like okay like i want or what do i do if i set up this and then scarab's gonna copy this and then i'm gonna tk like this and that but then you you get your like sky tyrant across the map and he crit misses like the first yeah exactly and then like you're sunk and you're just like oh i didn't plan for that well like that's always that's always a possibility and there's always like you know um with a more competitive mindset and like plan, there's always the possibility that like a even the most casual player can capitalize with the right kind of build. I know uh, early on in like my career when I was playing the 300 point uh, Age of Ultron Hulk, who had like two stop clicks and could regen to full from his bottom stop click. He gained rage tokens. Like he was just a crazy monster dude. I got beat by a my judge at the time was running uh, the Great Lakes Avengers, and I got beat because they had great synergy and he had great placement, and he you know he just managed to just outplay me. Like it was simple as that. Like his team was much worse than my one figure by far, but he managed to outplay me to the point where. I just could not capitalize at any point. And I don't want to say that like that's what you have to get your casual players to do, but you have to realize that like not every person that comes in and is super competitive is going to be at that kind of like level where they understand like you know, they might be playing the competitive pieces, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are playing the most meta way possible. They're playing the like most competitive piece but not necessarily they're like playing the most competitive way and so that's another factor to like realize uh if you're gonna limit stuff maybe so this is this is a magic story but it's applicable here um we had a customer who's he's since quit the game but he played magic for over 20 years and um he's he's always been very good at the game um, and he spent a lot of money on the game. And he um, he played against someone that was new to the game, and the person was complaining, well, oh, you only win all the time because you spend, you know, hundreds of dollars on your decks and you have all the best cards. If, if I had that much money, then, you know, um, then you, you would lose. And so um, this person, they, they handed them their most expensive deck they had with them, which was like almost $2,000. And then they're like, and uh, you have your your deck that's basically a twenty dollars starter deck, right? Yep. Okay. So you take this, I'll take that. We will play each other. 
and um, we're, we'll see how you do with my with my two thousand dollar deck. And um, <laughs> he crushed him with the twenty dollar starter deck. Yeah, uh, it yeah, I understand like that like uh, applicably to Heroclix, um, a very solid popper team can be well, out, like of a team popper. of uh, super rares and primes and chases. I actually that happened to me. Uh, just the other week, um, I was playing with a friend, and um, he grabbed out um, a Justice League team that was based on basically the um, JLU starter. Like over like, everything except for like one piece on the team was all JLU starter stuff. And I had this team I'd been working on for months um, that you know had like and it was Golden Age and it had like relics and like chases and it was it's, it's probably the most expensive collection of figures that i own and um um he started the game by hitting my whole team with flash and then um superman would just hunt me down and pummeled um red skull into the ground and um yep <laughs> yeah even like the best fall sometimes so it's it's i We'll never say that Heroclix is not a game based on money because there's definitely aspects I mean, certainly. that lend to that fact. It helps, uh, for sure. Sideline for, like, a, I mean, ever since ID cards and then even slightly, like, before ID cards, but ID cards were, like, the, the real big thing where it was, like, thank God they, they rotated ID cards out of existence, um, at least in modern, uh, because... That was like probably the biggest barrier to entry, as far as competitive goes, in a long time. And without that barrier, um, you know, like Prime Batman, who's a very cheap piece, even though it's like a Prime, very cheap piece, can still completely wreck a team. I think I like where we're at with this conversation. Um, we might have you back on, Alex, to continue because. It's a very intricate and hard yes. idea of like how to how to culture a venue to not only accept all kinds of players, um, and by all kinds of players, I don't mean like personally. I mean gameplay wise, play styles. Yes, all kinds of play style wise players, because it's a very intricate way that you kind of have to like weave these people together, and I don't think there's any quite like perfect answer but i think this little bit of information that we've kind of shared might help people that uh anyone that was like kind of you know on the edge and didn't know quite for sure this might at least add to your little utility belt of knowledge i think uh if you are a local judge i think for sure it's at least you know worth a listen so that you know kind of like what to expect and uh what to plan for. And if you're a player at a store and you don't feel comfortable talking to the store about these kinds of things, then um, my suggestion is to, to one, kind of figure out why you're not comfortable with it, but but two, likely look to play at another store. If you're at a store where you don't feel like you can talk to um, employees or the owner, even if you want to go that high, um, about other player behavior creating a negative experience for you, then that is not a good store. Um, so something to keep in mind. Yeah. And that comes down to just making people comfortable in their venue. Um, yeah. If you're, if you're, and understand that sometimes these situations venue. are very complex. Um, so if, if they can't just turn on a dime and solve it immediately, some, they are, they can be very complicated at times. Obviously it depends on the situation. Yeah. And it's not always like, uh, someone's getting preferential treatment because they're friends with like the store owner or because they've been there longer. You know, sometimes it's truly, you know, it's just a real hard idea. Like, you know, it's a real hard thing to process. Like this player that's been coming here for five years, he plays too competitively and maybe your store owner just doesn't know how to like curtail that kind of behavior. They're just like, well, like, that's just how they play. I don't know what to tell you because, you know, that's just how they play. Um, and in the, if that's the case, you know, 
maybe have them give this podcast a listen. I don't know. Uh, there's probably better like venues and uh, areas to point people in, but I think that for sure, uh, when it comes to hero clicks, it's not a bad place to start. Um, and it, you know, especially from like the the magic kind of tournament like get background. They've been doing much bigger, much better kind of tournaments and applying to, like, you know, Friday Night Magic. And uh, they've got Commander stuff. They've got, like, they've got a lot of different, like, things that attract a lot more people than Heroclix for, I'm assuming, about the same reasons. It just uh, happens to be that, like, Heroclix is a slightly much smaller company. So, um, well, WizKids is... And I wish that WizKids had Watsy money. Oh my god, that'd be <laughs> yes. that'd be so great. I do too, for multiple reasons. But uh, with that, maybe we uh, should convince Hasbro to buy them. <laughs> Neca, please sell WizKids to Hasbro. Um, that'll be my next chain email letter. I'll get thirty signatures at least. Uh, with that, we're gonna end this this issue of uh, new clicks on the block and we're going to go into a Simeon legend Jedi trainee Padwan tip of the week I think my uncle knows him he said he was dead oh he's not dead not yet you know him well of course I know him he's me this tip of the week is pretty simple. It's uh, called Don't Be a Jerk to WizKids Marketing Team. Wowee, I thought this was a real simple thing to do, but hey, there's real people on the other end of the WizKids Marketing Team. All they're trying to do is show people on social media their cool products, and when you constantly badger them and pester them about hero clicks, not only do you look like a real weirdo jerk person, you make this community look like a real weirdo jerk community. So please stop pestering WizKids on their non hero clicks posts about hero clicks. It's super weird and it also makes us all look pretty bad because, man, like, I do not care about their summertime Jazzy J, Jeff, Fresh Prince game. I have no idea what that game's gonna be like. I also just probably will never buy it. But you know what I also won't do? I won't comment and be like, where's WWE Wave 2? Give me new clicks. Because here's the thing. WizKids is a company that sells multitude of products. And as Alex can can confirm, HeroClix isn't even like their top seller. So their, their, their whole bottom line kind of relies on this other stuff that they tend to like push and the reason they push it is because it makes them money and it allows them to keep making these products that sometimes don't sell well enough to be like fully you know profitable so the more you complain and annoy their marketing team the more i think they're just gonna like shut down as far as like a marketing team because i know i would if i had to Listen to, you know what else is fresh, knowing what release dates for the second wave of WWE Hero Clicks. I don't know who this is, but like, I also really want to know the second wave of WWE Hero Clicks. they know, they will tell us. But yeah, that's the thing. I can confirm that. If they had any more than just the 3D renderings, they would let us know. They want to make money. It's not like they have them secretly hidden away they have a good reason as to why they're not sharing them um as frustrating as it can be please as this is your tip of the week please be nice to WizKids promotional team because they're they probably don't know any more than you they're told like hey here's this new thing go post about it on social media and that's all they get they don't you know, when they get, like, five questions, like, where's this? What's the ruling for that? Why is my ID card no longer valid? They don't know. They have to ask someone else at WizKids. It's a, like, it's a small company, but, like, the they're, these definitely aren't, this isn't, like, Kenny Pena behind the Twitter handle. This is a completely different person that does not play Heroclix for sure, 
So please be nice. And not only do they not know, they also don't have any ability to change the outcome. Yeah, that's the big thing is no matter how much you scream and whine and like kick your feet, this person cannot go to uh, like Justin Zoran and be like, Twitter is demanding answers, Justin. Give me them so I can respond. Like, that's not how this works. That's not how this will ever work. WWE Wave 2 is somewhere in limbo currently. And until they know like when and how they can distribute it, that's where it's going to stay. And it, it really sucks. I really don't like that. I really want WWE Wave 2. But at the same time, I'm not going to make somebody's day worse because I don't get what I want. That's just stupid. It's it's dumb. And don't be like that because that's awful. I think it's super simple. If they post about Heroclix, feel free to ask them questions about Heroclix when they're making posts or when V Muse is doing one of her videos, anything like that. Try to keep it on topic. There's plenty of other hobbyists out there that don't care about hero clicks, and it's not acceptable to ruin their time and their space and their hobby um, with ours. Uh, we wouldn't want people coming into hero clicks constantly talking about magic and only like diverting every conversation to other games. So we shouldn't do that to other hobbies. It's just rude, and uh, we should be better than that. It's pretty simple. But that'll bring the episode to a close in a spectacular fashion. What a great episode we've had here. I'm glad that uh, South Dakota is not in my hair for at least one more week. I've had two weeks of peace almost uninterrupted. Uh, and with that, I will say Dial H for Heroclix is brought to you by CoolStuffInc.com where you can find cool stuff in stock every day including the latest Heroclix singles and sealed products. You can also probably find Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince's Summertime Game. I don't know what it is, but you can find it on CoolStuffInc.com, I'm sure. Check them out, CoolStuffInc.com. Hail Hydra. So if you're looking for emotional satisfaction, my advice to you is seek professional hero clicks. No. Are you serious? Again? How many people even play this game? Like the hundred? Instant deadpan humor. Oh, how yeah. six yeah. people yeah. think I am funny? It's the hard day's work. Not that you know anything about that. Which absolute fools? It's not witcher nonsense. I'm gonna make hero clicks like that forever. Are you kidding me? Hey, Google, back some. Let's attack him. Wow, wow, wow.